they didn't grow up in a certain type of church. So, um, uh, but uh, it brought memories back to me and a little tear to my eye. Sometimes that happens. Um, in fact, that's one of the reasons that we do these songs that we engage in worship is because faith shouldn't just be a head thing. It should also be a heart thing. Uh, most of us tend to gravitate towards one or the other just because of the way that we're wired. And uh, yet both are important. It should, faith should be something that we do engage with our intellect, uh, but it should be something we also engage with our emotions. Uh, this morning... Uh, I have a sermon that uh, is packed with information, and so we're going to blast through it. Um, Usually I do sermon series around a particular topic. I do multiple sermons kind of uh, with a theme that ties them together, but last week Miguel was here, um, and I I heard he did a great job. Next week Bill Ludwig, as I said, will be here, and I believe he's talking about finding our identity in our uh, position before God, and so you won't want to be there for that. Bill's a great friend of mine. We talk very regularly, and we're very involved in each other's lives, and I know God has done a lot in his life in this area, so uh, I expect it'll be powerful, and and, uh, you won't want to miss that. Um, But that gives me the opportunity this week to give a bit of a one-off talk, and uh, so so I've kind of conceived of this somewhat like a a bit of a pep talk as we uh, get ready to enter a very busy season as a church this fall. and, and I want to talk this morning about a concept that is central to the Christian faith, but I think can be somewhat confusing, and that is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was a big deal to Jesus. He talked a lot about it in his teachings. If you read the New Testament, the kingdom of God is a phrase that comes up again and again and again. Jesus actually taught for us to pray for the kingdom of God to come in the Lord's Prayer. If you remember, there's a little line in there that says, may your kingdom come. And so it's something that we as his followers should be praying for regularly. Another thing that Jesus taught was that we weren't supposed to worry about our lives. We weren't supposed to worry about what we eat or drink, but we should make our first top priority. We should seek first the kingdom of God and everything else would be thrown in by God, provided. And so obviously this idea of the kingdom of God is huge. It was a big deal to Jesus. It should be a big deal to us. But I think there is often a lot of confusion around what it really means. And so my goal today is to help you understand the kingdom of God, how you fit into it, how this church fits into it, how it helps us explain what goes on around in the world in the world around us and why it was so important to Jesus. And I hope that what you hear today, maybe it's a reminder, maybe you already know, but, but I kind of hope that for some of you, it is a paradigm shift, that it gives you a new lens to see your everyday life in the world that we live in. So as we get started, I want to define the word kingdom. Kingdom is not a word that we use very often today, and so this is one of the reasons that this can be confusing. The Greek word here is basileia, and what it meant was the realm of authority of a particular king or queen. So here in Canada, we're part of the British Commonwealth, sort of, or maybe, or kind of. And so we kind of sort of maybe look to Elizabeth II as our queen, right? But Canada is not in any way a kingdom because the queen really doesn't have authority here. And if she did, maybe it would be a queendom. So I I don't know how that works. But it's the same with Justin Trudeau. He is our elected prime minister. He is in some ways our leader. But he doesn't really call the shots. He has to work through parliament. He has to work through laws and democracy. Canada is not his realm of authority. He can't just go around bossing people around. We're not his subjects. And so a kingdom, a kingdom is something different than what we would think of as a country or a nation today. A basileia, a kingdom, was a realm over which a particular person had absolute authority. Now, that's not so much about geography, okay? It wasn't the territory. It was the people, the subjects, the people that did his or her bidding, his or her will. And so when we talk about the kingdom of God, we mean that which falls under God's authority and especially the people who have placed themselves under God's authority. It is the territory, both in a figurative sense and maybe sometimes in a literal sense, 
in which God is followed and obeyed, in which his will is done. So I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but when we pray in the Lord's Prayer, may, may your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth and as it is in heaven, we're pray, praying the same thing twice. It's just, it's, it's a repetition, it's an explanation. For his kingdom to come, it actually means that his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so the kingdom of God is this realm, is this, is this invisible but also visible territory in which God's will is done. And I want to look at what the Bible has to say about it. Um, I'll start with uh, the Hallelujah Chorus, which I don't know if you knew that was scriptural, but it is that whole uh, Hendel's Messiah is all based on scripture. But there's this place in the Hallelujah Chorus where things quiet down a little bit. And I was actually going to show you a clip, and then I just decided it was way too cheesy. So um, some of you would have enjoyed it. Some of you would have had to really work to not laugh at the self-important-looking opera singer. And uh, I didn't want to have to put you through that in church. So um, anyway, uh, there's this spot where it, it sort of quiets down, and it says, The kingdom of our Lord has become the kingdom of, oh, sorry, the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and of his Christ, and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever, and he shall reign for It goes on, so maybe you can put that in your head. That's a passage taken directly from the Bible. It's taken from Revelation, which is this crazy picture of the end of the world, and there's scrolls and seals and trumpets and dragons and all these crazy symbols. But this is a phrase that is shouted at the, the seventh uh, trumpet and and this is the this is a picture of what is happening when God brings this era this time this age to an end and this is what Revelation eleven fifteen says the seventh angel sounded his trumpet and there were loud voices in heaven which said the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah which is Jesus and he will reign forever and ever and so what this is saying is that at some day in the future, when God puts an end to evil and suffering and pain once and for all, the kingdom of this world at that time will become the kingdom of God and of his Messiah, Jesus. And I think that that begs the question, doesn't it? Isn't this world already God's? Don't we sing this is my father's world? Isn't Jesus the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords? Isn't God the creator and sustainer of the universe? Isn't this already God's kingdom, his realm of authority? And in one sense, yes, the world we live in was created by God, and he's the sustainer of the universe that we live in. But in another sense, w the world we live in is not really his Basileia. And that's because he delegated his authority. He gave his authority for this world away. And we'll talk about who in a minute. But maybe you can think about it this way. I'm the owner or co-owner of our house. Yet there are rooms within that house that I wash my hands of. <laughs> where I have delegated authority, right? particularly to my children. And I cannot be held responsible for the way that Aiden's room looks. And I can't be held responsible for the way that the girl's room looks or what you would find on either of their floors. I swear to you, I bought dressers for all of them. <laughs> they would house their clothes if they did it. But by their own free will, they choose to strew the clothes all over. And now... I'm not going to say whether that's a hypocritical statement for me to complain or not. It's just a statement of fact. You know, I, I'm not going to talk about where they might get those tendencies from. <laughs> the analogy is the fact that God has given authority for the world away. That though he is still the ultimate owner and sustainer and ruler of the universe, that this world he gave his authority away. And that's why, on the one hand, we see his fingerprints everywhere and the beauty of creation and the joy and the love that we find in life, like we see evidence of a good, loving, holy God. But we also see pain and agony 
And we see, if we look closely, what looks like a dark, sinister power at work that often seems to have the upper hand. And that's because the scriptures teach that the world is actually under the power of Satan, God's enemy. Three times in his farewell speech to his disciples, Jesus refers to Satan as the prince of this world. So Jesus understood that the reason that he faced so much opposition in his life as he tried to do God's will was because he was in enemy territory. The reason that he was about to be falsely accused by his own people, handed over to the Romans to be tortured and killed, was because he had come into enemy territory, into a world that was not God's realm, not his realm of authority. Early Christians also understood this as they faced persecution and death because of their beliefs in Jesus, the Messiah. And so Paul writes this to explain some of the hard things they were going through. In Ephesians six twelve. he says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's people aren't our enemy. Human beings are not our enemy. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly realms. So he's saying that there are unseen powers, rulers, spiritual forces of evil that actually have authority over the world that we live in. This is why even today, when people try to follow God with all their heart and they have great motives and they try to do good, they experience opposition. Even when it doesn't seem to make any sense at all. It's because we also, 2,000 years, are still in enemy territory. Now, I have to admit that sometimes this is very difficult to believe or accept or understand as we live in sleepy little hollow or slip sleepy little Huntsville, not hollow, um, where people mostly get along and where we're just in perpetual vacation mode, right? That's, that's what Huntsville is, right, isn't it? But truthfully, though, we do live in a fairly peaceful town, and so sometimes it's hard to see that there are these powers of evil at work in the world, but I bet... If you lived in Syria, you would not find this so hard to grasp. If you were a Christian in North Korea, you would not have any trouble understanding that there were unseen dark powers in the world. If you're a Christian in Iraq or Iran or many places in the Middle East, this would be a worldview that clicked where you'd say, ah, this explains why people want to kill me for my faith. This explains why I see so much violence and war and greed and suffering and agony all around me. So if you ever find yourself wondering, why don't things work the way they should in this world? Why can't we get it right? Why is there still war? After all of our human progress, this is part of the biblical answer. Part of the biblical answer is we live in enemy territory. The kingdom of the world is not yet the kingdom of our Lord. It is the realm or the princedom of Satan. I know that is not a very cheery thought on a Sunday morning, and I promised a uh, pep talk, didn't I? It's actually kind of a hard pill to swallow. And I realize also that some of you might have to scratch your heads on this a little bit and go, do I really believe in a little pitchfork guy with horns? Well, you have to think that through. Don't picture the red pitchfork guy. Think about whether there seems to be a personal force of evil that's at work in this world. Maybe you could bring it into your life. Do you ever see a personal force of evil coming against you when you try to do what's right? Does it seem like things align, coincidences happen in such a way that it seems like it's like a deliberate attempt to throw you off track? Anyway, I'll let you think about that. But this brings up a whole other question, doesn't it? If Satan is in charge, why? Who put him in charge? Who gave him authority? And the, the simple answer uh, to that question is uh, we did it. So human beings put Satan in charge. So Genesis tells this story of the Garden of Eden, a perfect paradise. No pain, no shame, no mourning, no sorrow, no disease, no sickness, not even any death. So we were immortal at that point. And that was the world as it was meant to be, this utopia where love for God and for each other was perfect. We walked in harmony with each other and with God. And this is how Genesis 16, or 
sorry, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, describes the way that God intended the world to work. God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Not torture it or pillage it, but subdue it. Uh, Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and every living creature that moves on the ground. So whose kingdom was this world supposed to be? Ours, yeah. He, he gave it to us. It was this gift from God which he instructed us to rule over with the same kind of grace and creativity and goodness and love that he himself would have shown. So we were to be his representatives. We were made in his image. We were, we were his stewards. He put us in charge. God gave us dominion over the world. The way that I gave my kids, well, somewhat like I gave my kids dominion over their room because I still hold sort of veto power in that room. But God delegated. He entrusted us. And then he gave us the greatest gift that he could possibly give us, the gift of free will, the ability to self-determine, to make real choices. And in order to be able to make a real choice, you have to be able to choose the wrong thing, right? You could make a robot that seems to be making choices, but it's just responding to programming. In order to make a human being in the image of God that has free will, there must be the possibility of turning away. There must be the possibility of evil. And so God created in that garden a tree that represented the possibility of turning away from him, the forbidden fruit. What that was was his gift of free will to us, his gift of a choice. Without that tree and without a possibility of turning away, then free will would have been an illusion. We would have just been forced to follow him. Why why was it so important for us to have free will? Because you can't love without free will. And we serve a God who describes himself as love. And so he makes us in his image. Then we must have the ability to truly love. Love has to be a free choice. It can't be forced. We've got a lot of books and movies about that, don't we? But so God gives us free will. And what do we do with this incredible gift of free will? Well, according to the story, there's a serpent, another possibility to turn away. And the serpent told lies, another opportunity to believe something other than what God said. And at some point, you know, if it was the first day or the first year, wh- who knows how long it went on as utopia before they said, yeah, we're going to make that choice to eat the fruit from the tree that God told us not to. And at that point, when they chose to use their free will to follow Satan instead of God, they sinned. And sin is not just like one bad thing you did, like, you know, we have a tendency to kind of laugh at um, sin, you know, or describe something that's delicious as sinfully delicious or something like that. But but what we talk about when when they sinned is that they allowed this force to enter into the world. And, you know, when your computer gets a virus, suddenly everything is affected, right? Part of the nature of that virus is to invade every part of your computer. And until you can put a stop to it, it will continue to just take things over and send me spam emails. So uh, (laughs) sin entered the world like a computer virus. And it spread. It wasn't just one act. It was inviting that into the world. And the other thing that happened at that time was that the authority that God gave us to rule the world with grace and goodness suddenly got transferred to the one that we chose to follow. Does that make sense? If I have authority over something, but I'm listening to someone else, who has the real authority? The one I'm listening to, right? And so that's what happened 
to transfer the authority for this world to Satan. And now some of you might struggle with this story. Did it really happen? How does that fit in with evolution, et cetera, et cetera? And I'm not sure how important it is whether it literally happened or not because the thing is it does happen regularly in our lives. Regularly in our lives, God gives us free will to choose to follow him and obey him, and we choose to listen to the lies, eat the fruit, follow his enemy. And so the fact that it happened once way back in a garden is big deal. I'm in like I think that's important to understand. But the fact that it's happened billions of times since then, I think we can also understand on a more easy basis, right? The fact that you and I have not done perfectly, that we have sometimes chosen to give our allegiance not to God, but to his opponent, his adversary, to Satan. And so that's how Satan came to be in charge of this world, and that's why the world is in the mess that we see today, even though God intended for it to be good. God gave authority to us, and we gave it to his enemy when we chose to listen to him, and we continue to do that every time we choose to listen to the lie and join the dark side. And that's why we look around and see a world that's dominated by fear and greed, by hunger for power, a world that looks the other way while mil millions of people starve and die of preventable diseases. It's why, despite the so-called progress that we were making, when we read the newspapers today, we still see the same headlines we did 25 years ago. And when I read the headlines in my life, I still see the same struggles that I did 25 years ago. This is why there's war. This is why there's disease. This is why there's disaster, why there's pain and tragedy and sorrow and loneliness and poverty and death. It's because we took the kingdom, the realm of authority we had been given, and we gave it into the hands of something sinister and evil. And if we did not have a God who was infinitely patient and loving, that would have been the end of it, right? That would have just been time to destroy, start from scratch, give a, you know, we'll make, a, um, you know, another two humans and see how they do. But the thing is that from the very beginning, God didn't give up on us. He had a plan, and you even see hints of that plan in his message to Adam and Eve as he's uh, pronouncing a curse, which is really what this all this means, on on the things that he had created. Now, now the ground is cursed. Now things now things don't work the way they should. They're broken. And in that little speech he's giving them, he says to the serpent, he said, you're going to strike their heel, the heel of the human beings. But some point in the future, there's going to come a human being that is going to crush your head. And so God, even in the Garden of Eden, pointed forward to this time when victory over the darkness, over the enemy, would be coming. From the moment we turned away, he s began to enact that plan. It wasn't a quick plan. It wasn't an uh, uh, instant solution. It was a slow and steady, patient plan that would be played out across the generations, across human history, even to us today. So he called Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the patriarchs, and he formed the nation of Israel, a people for himself. And he gave them his laws, and he helped them establish themselves in their own land. And he gave them every possible tool to, to help them follow him. They didn't do a very good job of it. Neither would we have. But he sent them prophets to, to help turn them back to him when they wandered away. People like Moses and Joshua and David and Daniel and Isaiah. And some of those prophets predicted that there would come a day when God would put an end to all the awful things that went on in the world. To the violence and the suffering and the death and all those things that they dealt with in the same way that we deal with. These prophets came and brought this message that said someday there'll be a judgment day when God wipes that away. And so there were a lot of passages that talked about that. And a lot of them had something to do with a chosen one that God would send, a special servant called the anointed one or the Messiah. Or the Christ is the Greek term for it. And so uh, one of those passages was Isaiah 9, where it talks about what God is going to do someday. And here's what it says there. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. So in other words, there'll be an end to violence on the earth. For to us, 
a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal or passion of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And it wasn't just that passage, but a lot of passages talked about a king who would be established over a kingdom who would reign forever and ever. And he would usher in God's peace and the prosperity of God's chosen people again. And so by the time of Jesus, which is 700 years after this prophecy was written, they were very familiar in the Jewish culture with passages like this that talked about the coming of peace and the coming of a savior Messiah who would rescue them. And they assumed that what that meant was that God would come and rescue them from the oppression of the Roman Empire. And so they looked to this Messiah to come to give them freedom from being subdued by another nation. Now, do you remember what Jesus' first words were when he showed up on the scene? Anybody remember what he said? Mark 1, 14 to 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, pro Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come. I love that phrase. That's a good I, I hope someday I have the ability to say that. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. So what did people think that he was talking about? Well, they thought that they knew exactly what he was talking about. They thought that he was talking about the downfall, downfall of the Romans and the restoration of Israel's good fortune and an earthly physical kingdom there in the promised land. But Jesus goes to work right away in his teachings, trying to teach them that the real kingdom was different than that. He talks a lot about it. And if you read the Gospels, you'll see that several times he said, hmm, what is the kingdom of God like? And what shall I compare it to? And then he gives these teaching stories, parables we call them, where he compares the kingdom of God to something else. And he says, it's like a mustard seed. It starts tiny, but it grows into this huge plant. Or it's like yeast working through dough. It's just a little bit, and it affects everything. Or he says it's like a treasure, a hidden treasure, or a valuable pearl that, that is so incredibly valuable and worthwhile that it's worth giving up everything else for. And he says that the kingdom is like seeds that are planted in your soul, but it's really the condition of the soil that determines how they're going to grow. And then he says, well, the kingdom is also like seeds planted, and then there's weeds that are planted by an enemy, and they all grow up together, and we got to wait till the end to figure out which is which, and God will do that. And so when you listen to his teachings, it becomes pretty clear that the kingdom that he's talking about, the kingdom that's so central to everything that he's about, is not the kingdom that they were waiting for. It wasn't what they expected it to be. Luke 17, 20 to 21 says this, Once on being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, Jesus replied, The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Now, that, that's a hard little phrase to translate there. Some translations say, because the kingdom of God is within you or among you, things like that. What Jesus said was, it's in y'all. Okay, The kingdom of God is in you-ins or you's. And so in your midst, among you, or in you, uh, that's, you know, it's hard for us to understand exactly what he meant, but it's pretty clear that he's saying uh, it's not going to be this physical territory that I take. It's something that begins in the human heart as people realign themselves with God's purposes and choose to submit to his authority. Someday, this kingdom of God will come in an ultimate once and for all victory for now, Jesus began the kingdom as a subversive, incremental movement across human societies, across the centuries. The message of the kingdom of God was that God was invading 
the territory that the enemy stole to reestablish himself as the true king. But he wasn't doing it with a show of force, you know, coming in with guns blazing, blasting everything to bits. He was coming in gently and patiently, stealthily. And he would use everyday people, like his fishermen disciples, and like you and like me, to usher this kingdom in. He invited people first to surrender themselves to God's authority, to become a part of his kingdom by letting his kingdom grow inside of them. See, as long as my heart, my life, are not submitted to God, I think I'm calling the shots, or even worse, I'm listening to the voice of culture or the voice of the enemy. As long as I'm allowing other people to have that authority over my life, I'm not part of his kingdom. But I have the choice to submit. I have the choice to, to say this territory of my life is going to be part of God's kingdom in the world. And that's where the kingdom starts. It starts within us as we choose to give God authority in our life. But then it spreads. There's this natural movement outward from there. We become agents of this kingdom in the world around us. Once the kingdom comes inside of us, we begin to bring the kingdom to the world around us. And the people who are called, who align themselves with God's purposes, gather together in these kingdom movements that we call churches. And together, they work in enemy territory to usher in God's purposes, his will, his kingdom. The kingdom of God was something that started 2,000 years ago with Jesus and his disciples, and it's been slowly gaining ground ever since then, pushing back the darkness one little bit at a time. Not everything over the centuries done in the name of God or in the name of Jesus or in the name of church has been part of this kingdom, and that's important to understand. Sometimes the enemy kingdom has taken over the church to do its purposes. And yet the kingdom has continued to grow right down to us today. What does it look like when God's kingdom invades? The scriptures use phrases like prisoners are set free. Good news is brought to the poor. Chains are broken. Wounds are healed. Sins are forgiven. Relationships are restored. Love is multiplied. People find purpose and meaning. When God's kingdom comes, it means his will is done here on earth just as it is in heaven. It means that where there's poverty, it's alleviated because that wasn't part of God's original design. It means where people feel far from God and from each other, they're brought close by his love. It means where people feel burdens of guilt and shame, they're given a clean slate and confidence to go on. It means where people are trapped by sin and addiction, they find freedom and victory. It means where humans have been exploiting and destroying the earth that we've been given, we stop and clean it up and pay more attention to stewarding it the way in a way that honors its creator. It means that lies are exposed. It means that truth comes. Sickness and pain and suffering is relieved in the kingdom of God, whether by natural or supernatural means. That's why we pray for healing and why we send medical missions out. It means that greed is transformed into generosity, worry into peace, sorrow into joy, apathy into love. When the kingdom of God comes, it sets things right. It returns things to the way that they were meant to be on a spiritual level, but also on a physical level an emotional level, an intellectual level. And that's why we as a church have always emphasized not bringing just good news, but also doing good deeds, that we're about not just helping people spiritually, but also physically and emotionally and in very practical ways, because we believe the kingdom is not just about something that happens inside and visibly, but it's something that has visible, tangible fruit in the world around us as God does good in this world through us, as God takes territory back from the enemy. This is why circles 
is important. Why Bridges Out of Poverty is something we care about as a church because we believe it's something that is part of God's kingdom, something that God cares about. Because Jesus didn't just come with a message or a pep talk, and he didn't just come to die for our sins, but he went around, according to Acts 10, 38, he went around doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil. He didn't just come with words, but with action. And we have the same assignment today. So in light of this, how do we view our lives or our homes or our churches or, you know, the other churches in town on an individual level? Each follower of Jesus is an agent of his kingdom. We are operating in enemy territory. We're looking to expand and to promote this kingdom in any way that we can. And we're also making sure that his kingdom is an actual reality in us, that our hearts are under his authority, that we're following him, that we're surrendered to him. What about our homes? Well, I don't know if you know this or not, but the original church didn't have, they didn't have church buildings like this. They, they mostly met in homes and occasionally in public places. But I think those early Christians saw their homes not just as houses for them to live in, but as outposts for the kingdom of God. And the Christian message spread from house to house to house. And so each of their homes was viewed as like, as like a little outpost in enemy territory where God had the opportunity to make a difference in their neighborhoods. And I wonder what it would be like if we as Christians today began to see our homes as kingdom outposts. That if we began to think of the fact that, that maybe God has strategically placed us where we are so that we can usher his kingdom in, both on a spiritual level by sharing the good news, but on a physical and emotional and intellectual level by helping people however they need to be helped, to intentionally look for ways to do good deeds and to bring hope and healing. What about our churches? Well, our churches are simply just groups of disciples who band together for kingdom mission. Churches are part of the kingdom like platoons and companies and battalions are part of the army. Okay, They're just one piece of something much bigger that God is in charge of. And so we can look around at the other churches in town and appreciate and celebrate the ways that they are contributing to this kingdom that God is ushering in in Huntsville. The kingdom is bigger than any one church. It's bigger than any one denomination or tradition. It's something that all Christians are invited to be a part of. That's why, as pastors, we join together to pray together once a month. It's why Christians who belong to other churches have been so generous to us Think of my harrower and allowing us to use this building here. That's, that's a kingdom orientation. We're not his church, but he understands that we're part of the kingdom of God, and so he's been very generous with us. Same with Larry French, whose building we're purchasing uh, down in Port Sydney. I have seen in him this kingdom mindset that says, I'm not in this for myself. I see you're serving the kingdom, and so I'm generous with you. This fall will be filled with a lot of details of purchasing this building, this facility, this 15 acres down on Highway 11. How do we understand this step in the life of our church, a step that I fully believe God has led us to? How do we understand that in light of this idea of the kingdom? Well, on the one hand, it's not a big deal at all because it's just a facility. It's just a tool that helps us with our mission, that helps us do kingdom work. And whether we rent or own, and whether, whether it's at the school, whether it's here, whether it's in our homes, it's still the kingdom. So a facility really isn't that big a deal. Jesus made it clear the kingdom wasn't about physical territory. It wasn't something that could be observed or you could say here it is or there it is because the kingdom of God is in our midst. But in another way, it is a big deal. It's a spiritually significant step for us that God has led us into because we're taking that 15 acres of land and that little building there and we're saying we want these to be used for your kingdom, God. We want this to be a hub from which people are sent out into their neighborhoods and communities so that God's kingdom spreads throughout Muskoka like yeast working through dough. In the same way that when a crack house gets established in your neighborhood, you would look at that as a victory for the other kingdom. 
When a church gets established in a community, it is a victory for the kingdom of God worth celebrating, provided that the people in that church continue to focus on the kingdom and not the building. A lot of people have, over the last few months, been putting a lot of extra work into doing things that don't seem very spiritual, like designing and planning and researching and crunching numbers and attending town hall meetings. And over the coming months, there will be a lot more who are asked to be involved, wielding paintbrushes, swinging hammers, housing gas, feeding workers. And even after that, snow will need to be shoveled and floors swept. All kinds of different things are going to happen with this building. And all of it will be meaningless if it's just done so we can have a cute little church building or an ugly little church building, however it turns out. (laughs) But if that building becomes a hub from which God's kingdom can grow and spread, it will be very meaningful and it will be worth all the work, all the blood, sweat, and tears we put into it. It'll be worth every dollar that we give to try to make it happen. Because when a group of people are focused on bringing God's kingdom and establishing a permanent home in our community, in our region, that's a significant victory for the kingdom of God as long as we keep our eyes focused on that kingdom. So the scriptures tell us that despite all the evil and rebellion and awful things that happen in this world, God still loves our world very much, so much that he gave his only son to wipe away the disease, the virus of sin, once and for all. And because of Jesus' victory and his death on the cross, someday the kingdom of this world will become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he will reign forever and ever. But right now we live in an in-between time where the kingdom is coming, but it's not fully arrived. The kingdom is coming in my heart, but it's not fully arrived. The kingdom is coming through this church, but it's not fully arrived. The kingdom is coming in our community and in the world around the world, but it's not here yet. But here's the really cool thing that I realized as I was preparing this. Because sometimes you think, well, why didn't God just snap his fingers and make everything right back then? Well, here's, here's a thought. It was human free will that screwed up this world in the first place. And until that day when God intervenes once and for all, I believe he's giving us an opportunity to use our free will to fix it. That means that being a part of this kingdom and ushering it into our region, our communities, our neighborhoods is a choice that we have to make. It's not something God forces on you. And so as we wrap up, are you willing to give your life to be an agent of the kingdom? Are you willing to be part of the invasion of, combating the powers of evil with good? Are you willing to listen to God for his inspiration of what he would like you to do to accomplish his purposes in the world? Because each of us has a small part to play. It's not about us feeling the weight of the fixing the whole world on our shoulders. It's about us listening to his creative voice inspiring us of what we can do in our context. Are you willing to dedicate your home to be an outpost of the kingdom of God in your neighborhood. We're going to close with a song. I know it's late, but uh, we got through a lot of information here. So uh, uh, close with a song. And I wanted to give you something to do to respond to this. And there's a map on the wall at the back there. It's been there for a while. I didn't bother changing the little sign or anything like that. And it's just of Muskoka. I'm sorry. There are people here who live beyond Muskoka. You'll have to be creative with this one. Here's the thing. If you're willing to make your home a kingdom outpost, if you're willing to begin to think of your house, this place you live, as a place that God has strategically placed you to bring his kingdom into your neighborhood and community, I just want you to go back and make some sort of mark to indicate that, where you live. Uh, That map already has a few other things on there, including our fingerprints from an exercise like this several years ago. I've moved since then. Maybe you have. Maybe you weren't there at the time. But this is just an opportunity to say yes. Where I live, my, my little home, as humble as it might be, as imperfect as I might be, I want to offer it to God to be an outpost of his kingdom to reach my neighbors, to reach people who come in and to help them understand the love of God for them and to help them in any way that we can. 
There's a little statement on a green sheet of paper or a yellow sheet of paper back there that just declares your home to be an outpost of the kingdom and allows you to kind of put into words, this is what I want my house to be, a place where people can see the light that God is bringing into the darkness. And so if uh, you want to take one of those and put it on your fridge or put it somewhere where you see it, where it will remind you that that's who you are. You're an agent of the kingdom, and your house is an outpost for the kingdom. And, and our church is not where God lives. It's just a place where we're sent out to do the work of God throughout our week. You can take one of those. There's two versions. The green one is for people who live in families, and you can say, we want to do this. The yellow one is for people who are single or individual, and you want to say, I want to do this. Uh, take whichever one you think is uh, appropriate for you. We're going to introduce that new song again for the sake of the world. I'd invite the band to come up at this time, and uh, let's just spend a moment in prayer. This is a lot to take in, and it's a whole worldview shift, a paradigm shift, if we haven't heard it before. And God, I pray you would allow that truth to sink into us, and that we would hear your voice calling us to be a part of this kingdom that you're establishing in enemy territory. And God, where there is pain and suffering, Allow us to be part of alleviating it. Where there's poverty, help us to meet needs. Where there's hurt and sorrow and loneliness, allow us to be comforting and encouraging. And where people are far from you, allow us to be the, the voices that are calling them back. Inspire us with ways that we can use the gifts you've given us, the homes you've given us, to spread the news of your goodness. In Jesus' name. So as we sing this song, I, I invite you to stand.